bulletin or wondering why isn't that on the bulletin. It was like this. Kirby told us that she had a couple of pieces she could play. And when we began talking about which one would she do, well, why couldn't she do them both? So we'll just put one somewhere else. So guess what? We did. Kirby Gould is our representative in our region from the Christian Church Foundation. It's always a pleasure to have her here. And since I also know that she plays a violin, I usually ask her, how about let's have some music? So I appreciate her talent and her leadership in helping us with many of our major finances. So this is a great day. This is um, a month that many churches have celebrated leadership in churches, um, Lord, usually clergy leadership. Okay, George, I need your hands. Andrea, would you come up here with me a minute? You know there was a time when we needed some really great help. And guess who stepped up? Here she is. And Andrew, we want to thank you for all that you've done. And it's not that all of this has ended, because you are here and you are still working and a part of the church. But we want you to know how much we appreciate what you've done. And George is going to be my hands and hand you a gift from the church for all that you have done to help us in these months. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, as I've said, it didn't end with this. There will always be new beginnings. So thank you very much. Great, great. Uh, as we look and plan for things ahead, someone said, now how are we going to do some things? Well, guess what? Um, we are always talking about volunteers and how they can help. And uh, so we're looking for people to step up and help us do some things and be in some areas um, of leadership. So watch out. The train's getting ready to come in. As I look over our announcements, and I hope that you'll have a chance to look over them, uh, there are meetings scheduled. You'll see that list. Um, there is a regional women's meeting this Thursday. That particular speaker, uh, Terry Deal, has been here to share in our morning worships. Uh, Terry had an experience uh, several months ago at the border and helping legitimate people get into the United States to find a home and to have family. So um, I look forward to that particular meeting and what Terry will share in that. Next Sunday, we are going to be singing. I mean, we're going to have communion, and we're going to pray, but we are going to sing some favorite songs. And uh, I've already had people telling me what their favorite songs are. So we are going to sing. I'm, at, I'm going to ask, I know that some of the choir members are here, and if you will let others know, let us gather at 9.30 next Sunday morning because we're going to sing. And it will be one you know. If you don't, in 20 minutes you'll know it. But um, we've not had that chance to do that. And uh, Elaine's been working on it. And George has been in on it. And so we're going to work together on doing some singing. So... Um, let's do that next Sunday when we do some, a sing-along. As we look at other announcements, and I, I, don't, I didn't point out the card that was in your uh, bulletin, but please uh, at least give me some hint that you saw it. 
and then lay it back in the offering tray as you leave. Um, this does help us, and if you have notes you need to share, I hope you'll do them too. Since our meeting last week, we have shared with the Violet Klein family. Violet passed away, and the church was involved in helping uh, with the celebration of her life last Monday. So if you'll keep the Klein family in prayer, and uh, Pat's son did have surgery this week. <laughs> She's also been um, doing a lot of babysitting because another member of the family has been in the hospital. Pat, can you tell us from where you are what's going on? Okay. <laughs> Keep them well, right? Yeah. Okay. As Leela came this morning, she asked us to pray for her brother, Leon Roberts. He is waiting for a heart transplant. So we need to be cautious in our prayers. You know, uh, these are difficult times for them. And it will be a struggle even as we speak and as the time goes by. So, Leela, we will keep you in our prayers. Um, Frances Miller is on our list. It's talking about her daughter. Her daughter has had other problems, other concerns. The daughter's name is Nancy, and the son-in-law is Steve, and they are really having some struggles. So, let's... Uh, Make sure we keep them in our prayers. Katie Schaefer is on our prayer list. You'll look there at the beginning. Katie is 14 now. The Schaefers were a part of our church for a while. And there are major things happening in their family. So please uh, think of them. Um, there may be ways that we can help as the church. And uh, we are... Uh, looking into some of the things we can do. We know what some of them are, but to be a part of where they are and how we can help them. So be sure and keep an eye on that. If you didn't see the box in the bulletin, there's been a new addition to Dagmar's family. I'm reading down here in this little box on the bulletin. Look at your bulletin. <laughs> Emily was in the hospital for a while, but now Emily is a mother. Didn't she didn't see that. <laughs> and that's one of the first things she told me this week. And the baby's name is Merrick Ray Williams. So... We congratulate. I wonder where they got that name. <laughs> well, we congratulate you, Dagmar, in your new edition. Now I would invite others. Are there other concerns or other joys that you would share with us? Anyone? Um, our surprise, the Ray Peck High School marching band wrapped up a tough season with 105 kids involved, 
kids in and out with COVID, new directors, but we finished with a first place yesterday. Um, mine is an announcement. Um, as you all know, we are part of a um, bigger Baby Grace, um, and Baby Grace turns 15 um, next month. Um, so Ray Moore will be participating in um, their Day of Grace um, on November 13th, where a lot of, uh, 10 other chapters will be open the same day, um, passing out whether it's diapers or diapers and clothes. Um, we will be doing a open house. Um, so if you would like to come and help um, give out diapers, wipes, um, clothes, um, I could use your help. Thank you. Oh, it will be drive through and um, I asked my volunteers to arrive anywhere between 8.30 to 8.45, and we're usually done by 12.15, 12.30. And if you didn't get all that, ask her about it later. Others. Thank you, Beth. We are ready, George. I think. Our hymn of praise this morning, as it has been for the past few Sundays, is Majesty. And I think there's a repeat of the first verse. We've seen the, the, uh, the only verse that's there, I believe, twice. Uh, let's try for a little bit brighter tempo this Sunday, where brighter means faster. <laughs> Please stand if you're comfortable. Majesty, worship His majesty.
Good morning, everyone. Everyone here in this sanctuary and those who are worshiping from home. The, the Psalm 105 starts with these verses. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing praises to him, tell of all his wonderful works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we are in this place, this sanctuary, to remember and give thanks, to, to sing and pray, to hear your word and to gather around this special table. We pray for your spirit to be with us as we together pray the prayer you gave us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If any of you happen to have been around the Kansas City area in January of 2002, you might recall a little ice storm that enveloped our city. I remember it well, um, locked in our house with literally nowhere to go with the ice caked everywhere. It was reported that many areas received up to three inches of ice. There were 500,000 trees that were damaged or destroyed. Transformers were exploding everywhere and created fires that were destructive. And many people experienced outages of power, some up to two weeks. I remember the first time, for whatever reason or meeting, that I came out to Raymore to, for after, soon after that. And I was coming up to Foxwood and came up Mott Drive. And if you might recall that line of those beautiful Bradford pear trees that were just decimated, lying on the ground sideways, br uh, branches broken off. It was, I think I was probably brought to tears knowing the beauty of those trees before that terrible storm. But over time, those trees were, I presume, replanted or regenerated. And so for the past 20 years, those trees now look just like they did even before that storm. It's almost miraculous how something can destroy vegetation and life to a point of what we think is no return and then be brought back to life of lush, beautiful trees that give us beauty to look at and how they contribute to the life of our planet. It's not often that we can't think about when we come to this table that sometimes we come broken and downtrodden. Maybe our branches have fallen off. Maybe we've lost a few leaves this last few weeks. But when we come to this table, it allows us to exhibit regrowth, new life, to let God give back to us what we may have sloughed off in the week before. So coming to this holy table each and every week allows us to do away with the ice of the world and to let God's love and God's blessings and God's warmth warm our hearts and allow us to commune with Jesus as we come to this table each and every Sunday. Let us think of these things as we begin the contemplation of partaking of the holy meal.
Our communion hymn is number 576 in the Chalice Hymnal, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. We'll do verses 1 and 2. And on that night that Jesus gathered with his disciples, he took a loaf of bread from the table and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this bread represents my body that is broken for you. Each time you eat of this bread, remember me. And on the same time, he took a cup from the table, a simple cup of wine to be shared with his disciples. And he said, this wine represents the blood, my blood that will be shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you will remember me until I walk this earth again with you. Shall we pray? Here we are, gracious God, your people, gathered around your table as Jesus taught us. We come for the sustenance provided by this loaf and cup. We come with gratitude for the care with which you have surrounded us since we were last here. We come to ask for your blessings, God, and your continued love and care as we go out into your world to serve you. Help us to know and do your will now and in the days to come. Amen. O oh, gracious God, we come to you again 
we are probably not the same people that came last week. We've had experiences. We've done some different things. Or maybe we haven't done anything. But here we come. Looking again to some depth that will strengthen us. Looking at some height that we can reach to. You have planted ideas. You have planted dreams. You have stirred within us possibilities. And we are here in this worship space to help them mold and grow and develop. Gracious God, we know that everything we've thought about and looked at may not happen, or maybe it will be different for by your words and by your thoughts and by these last months, things are not the same. Help us adjust. Help us see that no matter what happens in our life or happens around us, this message of Christ, of how he loved, how he gave himself, and how he experienced something beyond is the very thing that we need and that we need to share. It is good news. And it is a seed that needs to grow and develop. Our world seems to be in a turmoil. And at times we think our nation is. Let your peace and quiet hand still us and help us see that because of you it will be better and there is hope. We ask you to be with Kirby this day as she shares in music, in words, and life that we may be renewed. God be with her. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Before I play my, my second song, I know sometimes that I'll hear a song and I'm thinking, I know that, I know that, why have, I've heard it before. And since it wasn't printed in the bulletin, I thought I'd tell, tell you the first song that I played was um, entitled Ave Verum Corpus by Mozart. And the words um, basically allude to the, the translation, Hail, true body, born of the Virgin Mary. The one we're going to play next is from Handel's Messiah. Uh, the song, Come Unto Him, and the lyrics uh, basically follow the text in the scriptures that says, Come unto him, all ye that labor. Come unto him, ye that are heavy laden, and he will give you rest.
Well, the scripture that I have chosen for this morning, sort of a fall-ish theme, comes from uh, the book of Mark, chapter 4, verses 22 through, or 26 through 32. He also said, The kingdom of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep and rise night and day, and the seed would sprout and grow. He does not know how. The earth produces of itself first the stalk, then the head, then the full grain in the head. But when the grain is ripe, at once he goes in with his sickle, because the harvest has come. He also said, With what can we compare the kingdom of God, or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up to become the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. When I was growing up in McPherson, Kansas, we had a neighbor two doors down. His name was Ralph Johnson. And every springtime around the middle of May or so, uh, we would be blessed with a large bouquet of peonies that came from his, his gardens. Um, I remember the fragrance, the smell, the, the color. I remember the ants crawl, crawling in the house after we brought them inside. <laughs> but uh, it was just something magical that every year I knew that Ralph Johnson was going to bring us those bushes. And so sometimes, or those flowers, I would sneak around the back door and, and look at his garden and look at all those peonies. And so I knew that when I had a house of my own, I, want, I wanted my own peonies bushes. Well, we experimented with a lilac bush that we killed, and we experimented with a Bradford pear tree that we killed. I mean, it was like, I'm not going to have any luck with this until somebody told me, you know, a peonies bush, it's a perennial. I mean, it, it comes, or is it annual? Wait, perennial, right. See, I don't even know that. It comes, it comes every year. And so we did. We planted six bushes in our front yard. Well, over time, some of the other bushes have grown over them, and our big tree is bigger, and so that those, my poor peonies bushes are not getting enough light. And we barely have a few blooms that come out every now and then, and I, I, every year, and I was just sort of getting sort of discouraged. So finally, we've hired a gentleman that's going to come and move our peonies bushes so that they will get better light and hopefully bloom and do uh, better each and every year. And I had hoped to share pictures of that with you because he was supposed to come on Wednesday, but it, he didn't. There were some issues. But peonies bushes to me just represent this marvelous opportunity of seeing something that goes dormant each and every year, but in the springtime it gives you those beautiful blooms and the blossoms and the smells and the aroma of something so beautiful that God has given us on this green earth. We find that the Bible uses stories and metaphors about the earth and seeds and harvest and fruit. Many of Jesus' parables help us understand that growth in the spirit, in our faith, and in our walk with Christ takes care and tending and nurture. Our lives will be like a plentiful harvest, full and ready to provide sustenance and nourishment for those you are, we are called to serve. So the parable of the mustard seed is one of my favorite scriptures as it describes something so small that grows to be so big and to be a place for even birds to come and rest. This has always given me a sense of both delight and comfort. But when the Israelites heard Jesus use the term the kingdom of God in this, as mentioned in this scripture, they thought they knew what he was talking about. They were under the occupation of the ruthless Roman Empire and they were told stories about the coming of the kingdom of God. The time when the God of Israel would finally reign as king over his people and the land. If the Jews were to be compared to compare the kingdom to any plant, they would have probably chosen the cedar. Hear these words from Ezekiel 17. I will plant a sprig from the lofty top of a cedar. On the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it. 
in order that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live. In the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. Jesus was probably playing on the people's idea of a cedar when he says the mustard seed becomes a tree, which is really more like a bush, which can grow up to be about 10 to 20 feet high, while a cedar towers to 130 feet high. For Jesus to say that the kingdom of God is more like a mustard bush than a tall cedar of Lebanon would have shocked his audience especially the farmers and the gardeners. That mustard tree was potentially a noxious weed, which could take over your gardens and crops. At the time, there were even laws prohibiting planting mustard bushes because of its threat to the other plants. It would be like Jesus coming today and saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a dandelion, Even though it is a small seed, it spreads an unstoppable plague across the cities. The kingdom of God is here, but it is more like a weed and a pest than a towering tree. To make things even more complicated, gardeners and farmers did not want pesky birds indulging in their garden. Not only is the kingdom of God like a weed, it attracts unwanted birds, which will further destroy your fields and economic livelihoods. But perhaps Jesus really knew what he was saying by saying that he wants us to be more like a spreading weed over the landscape rather than a towering, uniform cedar tree. Now the story immediately preceding this is the parable of the growing seed. A man scatters seed on the ground and then allows nature to take its course. As the man goes about his business, the seed sprouts, then it produces a stalk and leaves, and then a head of grain, and finally, fully developed kernels in the head. Jesus emphasizes that all of this happens without the man's help. The man who scattered the seed cannot even fully understand how it happens. It is simply the work of nature. Well, the first part of this parable contains the most important lessons to be learned. We tend to concentrate on the fact that the farmer waited for the harvest. His action was passive. But first, the farmer had to do something active. He had to scatter. Using the gift of seed that was granted to him, God then provides the stock, the growth. We can interpret the growth of the plants as the working of God's word in individual hearts. The fact that the crop grows without the farmer's intervention means that God can accomplish God's purposes even when we are absent or unaware of what God is doing amongst us. The goal is the ripened grain. At the proper time, the word will bring forth its fruit. There are times when we do things, but we never quite know what the results or the outcomes might be. Sending a donation to a charity, well, we hope it gets put to good use. Saying hello to a a stranger in the grocery store, we hope it helped them have a good day. Sending a get well card to a sick friend, well, we have faith that it raised their spirits. So so much of what we do is dependent on the faith we have that there will be a positive result on the other side. We know the crops require water and sun, but it really does seem miraculous when that seed finally sprouts. We often understand the science of the harvest, but we still stand in awe of how it actually grows. This has reminded me about um, a thing that our family calls, calls Claudisms. My, my dad's name was Claude. And after he died, we started thinking about all the cute little quirky, quipsy things that he would say. And one of them was <clears throat> how he described a thermos. Now, you know a thermos. When those old days he used to take one to work, you know, if you put chicken noodle soup in it, it was hot. If, if you put iced tea in it, 
it was cold. So my dad would say, you know, a thermos, it keeps hot things hot and it keeps cold things cold. But how does it know? <laughs> okay, you had to be in there. He really, it was funny. <laughs> how does the thermos know when you put chicken noodle in it to be hot or when you put iced tea in it to keep it cold? How does it know? How do we know? So using yet another image of a field, let's go into the book of Corinthians and Paul, as he speaks to these people as recorded in the third chapter of the first book. He is addressing conflict within the church's leadership. There were many differing opinions about whose teaching was correct or which spokesman was going to provide the best leadership. Even though the Corinthians possessed multiple gifts and talents and skills that could be used to build up the church, there was also great diversity. They had the same goal to make disciples, but they wanted to go about it in different ways. So hear this passage as interpreted in the Message Bible. Who do you think Paul is anyway, or Apollos for that matter? Servants both of us, servants who waited on you as you gradually learned to entrust your lives to our mutual master. We each carried out our servant assignment. I planted the seed, Apollos watered the plants, but God made you grow. Paul identifies the services that he and Apollos had provided in the Corinthian church Paul planted the seed by initially bringing the gospel to the believers in Corinth. Apollos, in turn, watered the seed that Paul had brought. One cannot say that either Paul or Apollos was more important to the church in Corinth. Without a sower, there would have been nothing to water. Without someone to tend the growing seed, it may as well not have even been planted. The good they received through Paul and Apollos should have contributed to the Corinthians' loyalty to God, not to their own self-appointed leaders. Human leaders are not to be our focus. They are only the instruments that God uses to grow his church. Paul argued that the planter and the one watering have one purpose, seeing the church grow and bear fruit. Paul and Apollos would never have disputed over credit for the work done in Corinth because each expected to be rewarded according to his own labor. They did not oppose each other, but they served the same Lord. So now let's go all the way back to Genesis, the creation story. Genesis 1, and I'm going to read for you verses 12 and 29. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seeds of, every, seeds of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for your food. Well, the story of creation gives us the promise that the earth provides us with all the resources we could ever need, with plentiful vegetation and fruit and fields to feed us, both literally and figuratively. God provides it all, everything, totally and completely. It is up to us as stewards of God's creation to use it wisely to sustain our own lives and to generously share with all of mankind. Often in our world, and even in our churches, we focus on what we don't have, rather than on what we do. We sink into the mindset of scarcity, rather than soaring to an attitude of abundance. We all have the opportunity to bear fruit for the church, whether that be from our time, our talent, our treasure, or our wealth, our wisdom, or our work. 
we can commit to steward our lives and our relationships with healthy, wholesome, and healing acts of kindness and selfless love to bring God's kingdom to earth. A couple of weeks ago, I ran across a quote by Ann Weems, and I actually put it on Facebook for others to, to read and to share. And she writes, The stewardship question is not really how much we will give. The stewardship question is how we spend what we have been given. And we know that kingdom building is hard. It takes work. And sometimes we may never see the fruits of our labor. Our work may be left undone for the next generation to finish. There is a wonderful quote by Elton Trueblood, which goes, A man has made at least a start on discovering the meaning of human life when he plants shade trees under which he knows full well he will never sit. This quote is paraphrased, and a, there's a paraphrased version on one of the walls in one of the buildings out of the Tall Oaks Camp and Conference Center, and it says, Faith is planting a tree under whose shade we may never sit. We cannot predict the future, but we can plan for the future, putting our faith in our plan and expecting that our journey will be fruitful with God providing the nourishment along the way. May we be ever faithful that our journey will be guided by God's grace and love, promising our lives to Christ as we seek to grow the kingdom of God on earth. Amen. As you've heard the message, we invite you to come as we sing our hymn of commitment. Our hymn of commitment is page, uh, ch uh, Chalice Hymnal number six, 612. Verses 1 and 4, please stand if you're comfortable. <clears throat> from this place be fruitful and multiply multiply your gifts multiply your investment in the life of this congregation in the life of your community in the life of the, the, the church of Jesus Christ we all have special gifts to share let us plant our seeds deep in the ground and let God give us our harvest <laughs> 